Okay, so uh, welcome. Normally we do we do this in, uh, in Tel Aviv University in real, but uh, actually I can see somebody. Uh, but this time uh, we have to do it due to the pandemics online. Uh, you know that uh, we actually inaugurated, uh, we established and tried to inaugurate two uh, main uh, centers, one on AI and data science and the other one on uh, uh, quantum, quantum science and technology. We planned a big event in May, which we had to postpone. Uh, and Professor David Gross, he was a keynote speaker in that event and he agreed uh, generously to join us and uh, uh, provide his vision on the topic. So let me say a few words about uh, David. Uh, he is also a very good friend uh, in general of Israel and Israeli physics. Uh, he is a theoretical physicist and a string theorist, a very well-known one. He received his Nobel Prize in 2004 for uh, a discovery of something which is called asymptotic freedom. Uh, instead of uh, telling you what it is, I can tell you that there is an American sitcom called uh, The Big Bang Theory. There are, there are several characters. One of them is a string theory, is Sheldon. And there is a whole episode on this particular calculation. So you can uh, watch it. It's really, it's really great. In addition to that, uh, David made many things. He was also, uh, he's a chancellor chair professor at uh, Santa Barbara. He was the director of KITP. He received many, many prizes, the Dirac Medal, Klein Medal, uh, uh, lots of uh, others. And uh, thanks a lot, David, for agreeing to share with us uh, your vision. And please. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here in the world of Zoom. Uh, I was looking forward to um, attending the inauguration of the new quantum center for the, the Center for Quantum Science and Technology at Tel Aviv University in May, not just honoring the uh, new center, but also my good friends, Yakir Aharonov and Michael Berry, who contributed so much to the understanding of quantum mechanics. So, um, am I now sharing? Can you see my screen? Yes. No. Okay. So, uh, I, Yaron asked me to give a very brief 10 minute introduction to the fascinating world of quantum mechanics and its applications. And it is indeed a pleasure to be, to do so, although uh, I would much rather have been in Tel Aviv <laughs> doing that, but what can we do? Uh, quantum mechanics is an amazing subject. It is in you know, physics rather new. It's less than a hundred years old. It was born uh, at the beginning of the last century and over a 25, year period, Planck and Einstein and Bohr developed the theory which culminated almost a hundred years ago uh, with the establishment of the quantum mechanical view of physical reality, Heisenberg, Schrodinger, and Dirac. And uh, it is now the foundation of modern physics. All of our studies of the physical world largely rely on quantum mechanical, strange view of, of physical reality. But in addition to just physics, quantum mechanics has laid the foundation for our understanding of chemistry and increasingly uh, its applications shape modern technology. In fact, dominate it. The main thing that we've learned for the last 100 years is that quantum mechanics works beautifully. It is a totally new way of looking at the world. Uh, it's very difficult for classical physicists to accept. And some, even Einstein, found it difficult and resisted quantum mechanics for a long time. But it turns out to be not only hard to modify, but mostly it works. It works 
in the original realm which it was proposed, namely to explain atoms. Why are atoms stable and how do they work and how do they combine to form molecules? And this was the great success of quantum mechanics at the, its beginning in explaining the structure and the properties of atoms and molecules, indeed laying the foundations for a quantitative understanding of chemistry. Remarkably, quantum mechanics didn't stop there. It went on to give us a detailed explanation of the properties of ordinary materials, which aren't just single atoms or molecules, but collections of billions, 10 to the 23 atoms, which form materials, the materials that surround us and have properties which until quantum mechanics were very badly understood and now are understood, conductors, insulators, semiconductors, and even superconductors. And from my point of view, as a particle theorist, now a string theorist, the most amazing success of quantum mechanics is in uh, its ability to describe quantum fields and give us the basis for a successful theory of matter. So quantum mechanics was invented to explain the structure within the atom, but over the last century, we used it um, to probe and eventually to construct a very precise theory of the atom, its nucleus, which is made out of quarks. We identified the basic constituents of matter and the three forces that act within the atom and the nucleus. This theory is, a, is a remarkably successful and well-tested and provides us after thousand, 2,000 years since Democrates with a detailed, quantitatively correct theory of atomic and subatomic matter. Quantum mechanics is strange, believe me. Anyone who doesn't recognize as Feynman said is dying. And many people have resisted and tried to find a underlying deterministic uh, basis for quantum mechanics. But more and more we, after a hundred years, understand that quantum mechanics really does make sense. And we're now comfortable enough with it to push it to new domains, to new extremes. There remain inter interesting issues of understanding the basic foundations of quantum mechanics, something that Yakir Aronov uh, at Tel Aviv University uh, is one of the leaders in trying to understand. How does the classical world that we're accustomed to arise out of quantum mechanics and how do we interpret this strange theory where you can have a cat that is both alive and dead until you measure its condition? However, most of us follow Feynman's dictum of shut up and calculate. And using that strategy, we have been able to, for example, as I remarked, calculate the properties of matter down to the nuclear and atomic level at, with amazing agreement with experiment. But more recently, um, with our increasing knowledge and control, quantum mechanics is almost becoming a subject for engineering dominating modern technology. The discovery of the transistor, which relied on the detailed understanding of the quantum mechanical structure of, of ordinary materials and semiconductors, integrated circuit, the laser, has led and dominated modern technology. And many of us believe it will do so even more importantly in the future. In my opinion, the applications of quantum mechanics are just beginning. The best is yet to come. Um, we now are able, not me, I'm a theorist, I work with pen and pencil. 
experimental friends are able to manipulate and control matter using our quantum mechanical understanding at the atomic scale to pick up individual atoms and place them where we want and to construct devices that can do all sorts of things and yet are made out of a few atoms and operate at the atomic scale. Potential applications of such technology is truly unlimited. We can, for example, create new forms of matter that are not don't exist on Earth by putting atoms down and placing them correctly and manipulating them. And these new kinds of matter, can, for example, graphene is the one of the most astounding uh, discoveries and uh, potential applications in, in the last decade. Uh, allow us to imagine types of matter with properties uh, that we have not yet observed, but intend to create. And the applications of this uh, are probably um, going to be immense, already are immense. So this is one of the driving forces now in the uh, mature quantum mechanical domain where our theoretical understanding is becoming extremely powerful and our experimental colleagues are able to perform miracles at the atomic scale. Among these many, many applications that one can envisage for quantum mechanics, perhaps the most exciting is quantum computing. As you know, much of our modern technology and indeed our modern science is based on the development of, of uh, computers, which allow us to calculate and uh, measure, control immense amounts of data. And that has been driven over the last decades by Moore's law, our ability to create faster and cheaper and bigger computers systematically. But that is reaching the limit of the atomic scale. At the atomic scale, uh, we seem to have an obstacle to keep going and developing ordinary computers. And here quantum mechanics might come to the rescue uh, in constructing a new kind of computer based not on classical bits off and on zero and one that you manipulate in a computer, an ordinary classical computer, but quantum bits which in some cases have exponentially greater power in doing calculations that you know, would be, are totally impossible to do on classical computers. Quantum computers are based on the fact that instead of classical bits, zero ones that you manipulate in your uh, iPhone to make it work, uh, quantum bits. A quantum bit can be strangely in a what we call a superposition. It can be both up and down, zero or one. And quantum bits, a array of quantum bits can in principle contain exponentially more information and new operations on quantum bits can in certain cases do calculations that are unimaginable by, with ordinary computers. And by the way, since the world we now understand is dictated by quantum mechanics, quantum computers can simulate quantum systems and allow us to understand in great quantitative detail how they operate. So we expect that if we could construct a quantum computer, we might be able to of ordinary terms and molecules to such an extent that we could imagine total quantum control over, for example, chemistry uh, with enormous, enormous potential for applications. Uh, and that has driven many quantum scientists of the last decades 
to start trying to actually construct a quantum computer. I have no doubt that a quantum, quantum computers will be built. Will it take 30 years? Will it take 10 years? I don't know. But somewhere in that range, we will build quantum computers and their impact on technology, on computing, and on fundamental science will be as large as the development, uh, probably even greater than the development of the computer was uh, 50 years ago. So quantum mechanics is enormously exciting physics at the most fundamental level and enormously exciting technology at the, at the most practical level. Quantum computers are difficult. The environment destroys the fragile quantum states you must manipulate to do quantum calculations. But this too will be overcome. And uh, so I would like to just end in this introduction by congratulating Tel Aviv University in establishing the Center for Quantum Science and Technology people here who are interested in the foundations of quantum mechanics, in pushing quantum mechanics to explore new frontiers in fundamental physics, together with engineers and technologists who are interested in applying this knowledge uh, to create new materials, new devices, and new ways of computing and controlling nature. Thank you. Thank you, David. It was a really a great pleasure. And hopefully we will see you again in real within a few months at Tel Aviv. I hope so. Uh, okay, I will, uh, uh, yeah, I will uh, share with you now uh, a brief presentation. Okay. So uh, we have in physics this uh, saying that uh, never deny the pleasure of repeating what uh, you already know. So I'm going to repeat what David already told you and you already know. Uh, it will be a little bit faster. It will be a quick crash course on quantum computing. At the end, I believe that uh, uh, what I would like to achieve is that you will think that this is really a great stuff and uh, you will go to Google and begin to learn a little bit more. So uh, we have in physics a theory called classical mechanics. Classical mechanics is the physical theory that describes the motion of large objects like cars, like planets. And uh, it is a deterministic theory in the sense that uh, I can predict with absolute certainty where Jupiter will be tomorrow and in the next day, etc., etc. But I cannot move. Okay. Classical mechanics is also the basis for uh, classical computing. The computers that you use, your desktop, your laptop, your iPhone. And as David was saying, it works on bits, which are uh, can be either zero or one, on and off. And everything that you write, your document, your uh, investment portfolio, everything on the computer is stored using zeros uh, and ones. And uh, if you look at the state of uh, your portfolio, it will be represented by a bunch of zeros uh, and ones. The other theory, which is called quantum mechanics, it's a physical theory that describes the dynamics of tiny particles like electrons, photons. Some of you have been with us at CERN at the, visiting the accelerator. This is the physics of that accelerators. But quantum mechanics is also a statistical theory in a sense that I, it's not a deterministic. We cannot with absolute certainty tell you certain things. And this is not a technicality. This is the true nature uh, of our universe. 
And quantum mechanics is the basis for quantum computing. Now, if you take a programmer, an ordinary programmer of a classical computer, and you tell him to uh, program a quantum computer, it's a totally different ball game. It's a totally different paradigm. He has to learn different things. And one of them is this, this things that uh, David was saying, that actually it's not only zeros and one. You can be in zero, you can be in one, you can be in a superposition of them. It's a very complicated state. And this is the power of the computer, is the state of the computer takes all the possible states at the same time. This is this exponential power of the, of the machine. How do we know that quantum computer can be built, as David was saying? Well, the universe is a quantum computer. The universe is a huge quantum computer because that's the way it calculates things. When it evolves, when things happen, they all follow the rules of quantum mechanics. However, in order to work with the, these quantum objects, there are certain things we need to learn. One of them is called entanglement. This is what Einstein used to call a spooky action at a distance. It turns out that these tiny particles remember where they came from. And even if you separate them for long distances, they are going to affect each other if they were in a sort of an entangled state. In the language of quantum of computers, one part of the code that you write as a, as a programmer can affect another part which is entangled with it. And as David was saying, this is a tricky business because to, pre, to keep this entanglement, you need isolation from this environment. This is one of the biggest problems of building a quantum computer. How do you keep it in its quantum state and uh, uh, minimize the effect of this environment that tries to destroy it. This is called entanglement or spooky action at a distance. The other interesting property of quantum mechanics that enters in quantum computing is no cloning. So you, we are used to the fact that we can take a document and Xerox it many times. It turns out that this is an illusion. In the quantum world, there is a unique copy. You cannot copy twice anything. So if you have, for instance, some uh, object stored in your qubit and you want some information and you want to copy it, it will destroy the original one. If you are trying to listen to a quantum channel, you are going to destroy the message. You cannot copy it. Therefore, quantum channels are absolutely You cannot copy it. And this has dramatic effects on cybersecurity and on programming, but it has also something very interesting, some impact on something which is called teleportation. Some of you remember this uh, Star Trek uh, movies. There is this uh, machine that teleports you, uh, used to be called Beam Me Scotty, and then it takes Scotty from one place to the other. One can do it quantum mechanically. We can, we can teleport a particle from a place to a place which is, that is a very, that's very far from it. However, the way it's done is you destroy the original copy and then a new one is created at the place where you want to uh, uh, beam. And so this is a dangerous thing to, to do, to uh, teleport yourself because you have to destroy yourself and then recreate it somewhere else. But this has huge implications for security and for quantum uh, computations. You cannot simply copy pieces and move it around. David was mentioning uh, uh, Richard Feynman, who was a physicist, uh, a very famous physicist, who also, uh, was the, uh, the one that came up with the idea of quantum computation using it uh, as a tool to simulate uh, physical systems. He was also a very interesting character. Uh, you know, one day he uh, dressed up for a lecture and he was wearing a suit and a tie and his uh, wife was asking him, you know, why do you do that? I mean, normally you don't dress with a suit and a tie uh, for a lecture and then he said yes usually I know what I'm talking about so uh, on quantum physics indeed he coined many interesting phrases and one of them is actually none of us really understands quantum mechanics we know how it works but uh, we don't understand the intricacies 
There were very important milestones along the way. In 94, Peter Shaw came up with an interesting algorithm that showed, that proved that quantum computers can be exponentially faster. Uh, Grover uh, found an interesting algorithm that uh, uh, that speeds up data search, uh, uh, searching in, uh, in unstructured databases, which is very important for fraud detection. And since then, there have been interesting algorithms that are being developed uh, uh, on and on. At the moment, we do not have a quantum computer. We have small quantum computers dedicated to solve particular problems. We do not have a universal, universal what is called universal fault tolerant quantum computer on the cloud that we can connect to, but we can connect to some that can do all kinds of calculations. But as David uh, said, and I, 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 I'm sharing the same optimism, within a decade, we are going to be in a different place. Thank you. And uh, this will uh, uh, conclude the part that we uh, decided uh, to share with you on quantum science and technology, a very small piece. Uh, and that at this point, we will move to two uh, lecturers, uh, Michal and Chait, and they are going to talk about uh, AI and uh, data science. So Michal, you are with us? Yes, I'm here. Okay, so Michal, uh, Professor Michal Feldman, uh, she's from the computer science uh, uh, department. She, her research is on computational game theory and applications to peer-to-peer -to -peer, uh, uh, networking. Uh, he, she is also a researcher, visiting researcher at Microsoft Research. She had, uh, during her career, uh, um, many things. She done many things. She's been at Harvard University as a fellow, and uh, she has been a member of the Global Young Academy from 2011 to 2015. And uh, please, Michal. Thank you. So let me share my screen. Great, can you see it? Yes. yes. Okay, good. Yeah, okay, so um, thank you, Yaron, for the introduction. I, I'm very happy to be here and to see all of you. And I'll tell you a little bit about my area that is called uh, sometimes economics and computation or um, algorithmic game theory, computational game theory. So let me first start with the background. Uh, why do we care about this area? So uh, the internet is the source of everything, and the internet has become a huge computational platform for complex markets that enable the flow of economic uh, value between different sides of the markets. And these complex markets include um, many types of applications, including uh, many of them that you see here, like AdWord auctions, market for lodging and rides, crowdsourcing, cloud computing, online commerce, spectrum auctions, and many more. And all of these applications require very smart algorithms in order to function. But what's special about all of this is that in order for these algorithms to be relevant and efficient, we need to consider many types of applications and, and of considerations. And these algorithms should, for example, be computationally efficient. They should run fast, but they should also address the economic considerations. We want them to be economically efficient and they should respect the fact that in a distributed system like the internet, the participants are very often acting strategically in order, to, in order to maximize their own benefit from the system. And the area of algorithmic game theory, or in short AGT, lies in the crossroads of all the relevant disciplines to study these applications, computer science, economics, and game theory. And it offers a unified framework for the design of algorithms with proper incentives for collaborations in these complex settings. So of course I only have eight minutes. So I chose one or two examples to, to demonstrate the area. A canonical example is the design of auctions. So let's go, go back to the sixties. Um, in an auction setting, a simple auction setting, the seller wishes to sell an item to, to one of many potential buyers. So let's uh, suppose now that I want to sell this beautiful painting to one of you, to one of the people who is sitting in this uh, Zoom meeting, and I want to allocate this painting to the person who values it the most. Okay, great. 
But the problem is, the main challenge is that this value is your private information. I have no way to know your value. Of course, I can ask you for your value, and then I can give it to the highest. I can ask you for your value. You submit bids, and then I can give it to the highest bidder, and that bidder would pay her bid. Um, the problem is that you probably, if I, if I design this auction, you probably won't tell me your true value, right? Because, you know, you'll start strategizing and thinking uh, strategically. So if David uh, wants this painting for $100, he would look around the room and say, oh, maybe, you know, Yaron, I don't think he really appreciate this painting. He would probably only bid $50. Why should I bid $100 and pay $100? I can bid maybe $60 and make this profit and the question is okay so i i want you to be truthfully because if i if you don't be truthfully i don't know that i gave it to the person who values it the most can i design an auction such that has the, the following quite amazing property that every person has incentive to bid truthfully no no one can benefit by misreporting her value and the amazing answer by Vickering back in the 60s is yes. And I can do it with a slight change of the auction design I told you before. It's called second price auction. And the trick is that I give it to the highest bidder, but she pays only the second highest bid, okay? The proof for this is very rigorous. It's very simple, actually. If I had five more minutes, I could show you the full proof. But I'll leave it for you as an exercise. It's a cute exercise, so just convince yourself that there is no way you can benefit by misreporting your value. Okay, great. So this is uh, all very nice, but quite old, as I told you, it's from the 60s. What does it have to do with my research, internet, big data, data science, etc.? So uh, now, instead of uh, thinking of a single item auction, let's think about the huge scale auctions that happen on a daily basis on the internet. These include uh, FCC auctions for wireless spectrum, sponsored search auctions in all search engines. Some, some of you may know that whenever you enter a keyword in Google, for example, you know, back in the days when we wanted to, to go on a vacation, and we could write uh, vacation New York, as the, the second you enter, uh, you click enter, there is in real time an auction between hundreds and thousands of advertisers who want to advertise to you their hotels, rented cars, airline tickets, etc. This is all run in huge auctions among many, many uh, bidders in real time. And also millions of simultaneous item auctions in eBay. And um, these auctions impose many challenges. So let's see, computational, how to compute an allocation, how even to gather all the information from the bidders. It's huge, it's exponential. Economic challenges, how to achieve good welfare, good revenue, strategic, how to incentivize bidders to breed truthfully. So I told you before about the second price auction, which is really a miracle, but this was for a very, very simple scenario. And of course, behavioral, how can we account for the cognitive biases? We cannot just assume people are truly rational and truly utility maximizing because we are now very well aware of the many uh, cognitive biases and behavioral effects that affect people's behavior. So this is part of, of what we do in, in, the, in this area of economics and computation. We try to use all these bodies of information in order to address all these many challenges in a unified way. So it's not every, every, every one of these challenges is quite challenging, but now suppose that we need to, in order to, to, to write good applications for the internet in this crazy world, we really need to address all of these in a unified way and to think about models. And my work, actually, it sounds very uh, applicable, but I'm actually also like David, I work with pen and paper and I write models and, and, and do theoretical work. But we, we write models that encompass all these uh, huge world of considerations, including economic, strategic, and computational. So just to give you a, a short example of behavioral effects. For example, the endowment effect um, was turned by also a Nobel laureate, Thaler, 
who observed that people tend to assign higher value to items they own. Now, this very simple effect has huge implications on resource allocation on the internet. And in our research, we try to understand the implications of the endowment effect on the design of internet applications. And in the last minute I have, let me just uh, talk about one last application, which is routing, which includes both uh, routing of packets in the internet, but of course also just traffic routing. How do we, how do we optimize applications such as Waze um, that help millions of people to navigate their, their way every day? So network design and routing impose again many computational and strategic settings. And this, as it turns out, strategic behavior must be taken into consideration when we design uh, routing and navigation policies. And in some cases, uh, very interesting and fascinating phenomena can occur. For example, there is a known paradox known as brass paradox, showing that if I add a fast lane, or even connecting to your own stock before a teleportation channel, I may get into, uh, into situations where all drivers are worse off. So consider, for example, this, this uh, picture that I have here. And suppose all the drivers want to move from node S, from the source to node D, to the destination. And each one should uh, choose one route, either through A or through B. In an equilibrium, in this scenario, half of the traffic will go up and drive for 1.5 hours. This X represents a road that it takes uh, the amount of traffic that goes on this road. This is the time it will take. So every driver in the up route will take 1.5 hours and the same in the bottom. And this is an equilibrium. No one can benefit by going to another lane. So everybody drives 1.5 hours. Now, suppose we have this teleportation that Yaron mentioned from A to B and a fast lane from A to B that takes zero hours to, to drive, okay? Because the government uh, thought about this and said, okay, no way we can allow a situation that it will take 1.5 hours driving from S to D. What would happen? So now suddenly this half-half situation is no longer an equilibrium the strategic considerations will make every driver take the zigzag road that now takes two hours. So now every driver will drive two hours and this will be the unique equilibrium of the game. So this very simple and cute example shows how important and crucial it is to take the strategic considerations into account. So just to summarize, algorithmic game theory offers a unified framework for the design of algorithms with proper incentives for collaboration in complex settings. And results from this area serve to provide qualitative insights for design rules that are beneficial in practice. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michal. It was beautiful. Uh, now, uh, actually, we cannot, uh, uh, you know, have, uh, we, we must have actually something about the pandemic. So we are going to discuss now AI and applications to COVID-19. And Professor Haid uh, Grinspan is with us. Haid? Yes, can you hear me? Ah, yes, yes. Okay. So uh, Haid uh, heads uh, the Medical Image Processing and Analysis Lab at the Biomedical Engineering Department here at Tel Aviv University. She's been conducting research in image processing and computer vision for the past 20 years, special focus on deep learning, image modeling and analysis. And uh, okay, uh, history, uh, her uh, postdoc was at UC Berkeley. She joined Tel Aviv uh, in 19, 1997. She has been also a visiting researcher at IBM and several other places. Uh, Haid, please. Okay, first of all, can you see the screen and hear me well? Yes. Great. So thank you for inviting me to take part in this session. And I'm very uh, glad to share my research space, which is um, AI in medical imaging. Um, yeah, let's see how we progress. Okay, so medical imaging are key in medical diagnosis. They help us in um, detection, 
um, of findings and then in diagnosis aspects and then um, measurements. So for tracking changes over time and for um, drug efficiency, efficiency and so on and so forth. Um, and because of this, um, we have more and more imaging being taken worldwide, as you see here. Now, this um, fact is um, providing or leading to a challenge on the healthcare system. And uh, let's focus for a minute on radiologists, where they have limited time to review an ever increasing number of images. Okay, um, and this in turn is leading um, to missed findings, long turnaround time, and uh, inconsistency in the quantification of these findings. In general, there's no real time for the radiologist to measure findings. So this, of course, is very um, difficult then for follow-ups and uh, evaluation of drug treatments and so on and so forth. And this is a, a worldwide issue um, in, in general problems, uh, challenges of, of healthcare, uh, over the entire world. Okay, so we want to introduce some technology uh, to support uh, the radiologists and, and healthcare as a whole. And um, basically we want to bring computational tools from engineering, computer science, um, which uh, we will term now AI, artificial intelligence. The technology that is um, most state-of-the-art is called deep learning. And what you see here, um, in this um, network, the deep learning is actually a, a variety of architectures that we can build where we include multiple computational units, which are shown here as circles. And we are talking about thousands of such computational units and they're layered often in layers, which is where the term deep comes from, from many, many layers. And you see they're also connected with um, uh, these connections that um, we can design each of them has a weight, and these are the free parameters of such systems. Now, when we're talking about learning, these systems are learned, um, basically uh, learned from examples. And this requires a huge amount of examples. By example, I mean that you, in, in my space, the input is an image and the output provided to this network is a label. For example, an input uh, is a cat image, the output would be cat versus an input which is a dog image, the output would be dog and so on and so forth. And we're talking about millions of such image examples that are needed in order to learn these huge systems, computational systems. Um, when the medical imaging community started to enter this space uh, was around 2015. And the immediate question was if this may be relevant to us as well. It was not clear that it's a relevant technology. And the reason for that is that we have what we call the medical data challenge. So if you think about data that we have in the medical environment, um, it's very difficult for us to ac access um, images from hospitals. Um, definitely when we need many, many such images for every pathology that we're interested to detect. So that's one problem. We don't have enough data for each type of application. And we also ha have a difficult time with the labeling of the data. We need the experts to label the data. And of course, that's timely and, and costly and so on and so forth. So it wasn't clear that we can do this uh, in 2015, but as you see here, um, uh, major publications came out in books very soon afterwards. Basically, the community was able to come up with what we call tricks of the trade and how to really um, include the information that we need in order to extract information. So let me show you some examples. Um, one um, very uh, interesting um, solution that we found in the early days of 2015, uh, was that we can transfer information between different modalities, between different applications. So um, what you see here is that we first looked at x-rays and we wanted to identify different pathologies in an x-ray. Um, for example, we wanted to see if there is liquid in the lungs, if there is an enlarged heart, and many other kind of pathologies that one can see in one single x-ray image. And what we found um, that really opened up the field is that we can take a network that was trained on other kinds of images like the cats and dogs and snakes and elephants and clocks and whatever, uh, millions of such uh, images. And these kind of networks were able to sufficiently represent the medical imagery coming in 
uh, to then be able to classify it into the different pathologies that we're interested in. Um, now, when we have data that is available to us, um, like hundreds of thousands of x-ray data as provided by NIH starting in 2017, we can use um, augmented networks and we can fine tune them, which means we're now learning also from the x-ray data, not just from general imagery data. And we can achieve very high clinically relevant results um, and you see here also maps of um, color, which are localizing where the pathologies are. So we can, um, we, we saw that we can reach very um, interest, I mean, strong classification results and also localization results. Um, now let me show you some other domains that my lab focuses on, like uh, we do work on MRI brain lesion analysis. And here you see um, lesions of multiple sclerosis that are automatically detected by specific networks that were trained um, and comparison them to the experts would show nice results. We have um, for many years worked um, with the CT abdomen unit at Sheba uh, on supporting the radiologists there from the detection, which you see here in green. So we detect the liver, but then we also detect the lesions. Um, then once a lesion is detected, we want to classify the lesions into malignant or benign. Um, each of these questions is a different kind of solution, a different kind of network that we uh, need to generate. And this has led to uh, much success. Um, and finally, as mentioned, uh, in my lab, we also recently, very recently, uh, started to work on the COVID-19, which is a new pathology that we have all become interested in. So this is an interesting story because um, January, February comes around and radiologists start to show the community what the manifestation of this disease looks like inside um, a CT image. Uh, and Adam Bernheim, a radiologist from Mount Sinai, uh, took um, images from several uh, hospitals in China. And he was one of the first radiologists that indicated to us that we can see manifestations of the disease in the lungs. And he called them ground glass opacities. Um, and uh, as you see here with these arrows. By March, a collaboration that we formed with several groups, including radiologists from China, Mount Sinai, and Elliot Siegel from Maryland, we were able to build a system that um, analyzed this imagery and automatically extracted um, the detection of the disease and its um, quantification as well. So I'd like to show you um, a little bit of our results. In, in the system, uh, you see that we combine 3D analysis um, and 2D analysis. And many of these um, steps are, um, each one of them is actually uh, requires building of a network. But this was very rapidly developed because we, again, uh, utilize information which we already had. We transferred a lot of the know-how from other domains that we worked in and were able to use very limited amount of data, which is critical, in, as I mentioned, in the medical space. Uh, this data was just coming in um, initially only in China. It was very difficult to get the data. So we, we use, were able to show with limited amount of data that such systems are, in fact, um, um, possible to, to build. And here are some of the results. So here we, I'm showing you 2D slices. Um, each one of those was detected as a slice that has the pathology in it. And you see on the bottom, um, this colored label map, again, indicating the lo localization of that pathology, like we saw in the x-ray. Now we can take these slices and we can stack them up and we can get the full volume of the lung. And then we can see in red all the areas or the volume of the lung that has this opacity, the, this disease. So the these disease parts of the lung are shown here in red, in fact, also in green. So these are two different um, networks that we're working in parallel. And if we look at this, uh, we can basically come up with a biomarker, which is the measurement of the relative volume of the lung that has this opacity burden. We call it the corona score. Now in China, for example, they use CTs to follow up the patients. We, we could get seven and sometimes even nine CTs per patient um, as they were following the disease. And you can see that we can get the score for each one of these steps. So we can basically do patient monitoring where we use this corona score to 
define the relative severity of the disease. And here what you're seeing on the left are um, 14 different patients um, where um, the, top, the, um, the top lot, excuse me, presents uh, a more severe case, the bottom ones are less severe. And then on the right, we can see the course of the disease uh, as it's progressing. So we can see sometimes it becomes worse before becoming better. And sometimes it is um, um, just stays or becomes better um, immediately and so on. So we believe that this kind of a score can help us identify patient populations and support the treatment. Um, to summarize, um, AI in medical imaging is a very exciting space. We're developing tools for detection analysis in many different modalities, many different tasks. Um, hopefully these tools will support uh, improvement in healthcare as a whole. And when we look at COVID, um, we saw us and many other groups now in the world that we can develop solutions very rapidly. It was very interesting that the AI can learn together with the radiologists. Usually we learn from the experts. In this scenario, we were developing it in parallel to the radiologists understanding the disease. And right now we're focusing on, um, say, predictive models. We want to um, combine the imaging with additional clinical data uh, to get a better model for a patient and then support patient treatment, and hospital management, and so on. What you see down here is uh, a very recent paper that came out um, of uh, myself and some of my colleagues, um, where we're summarizing some of the uh, advances in the field and its prospect going forward. And I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Rait, uh, for sharing with us this exciting domain. And uh, yeah, we'll follow on that. Uh, now, uh, last, last, but last but not least, uh, Dr. Omar uh, Mark Shmulevich, who is uh, the director and the head of the Zimin Institute. Uh, Mark uh, has a 10 year uh, track record in engineering innovation from space and quantum technologies to IT. And Mark uh, is going to share with us uh, his visions on expanding Tau's impact. Uh, Mark, please. Thank you very much, Yaron, and hello, everyone. I have just five minutes, so I will try to be really uh, brief. Um, when I was listening to David uh, opening the session, I recall that uh, almost 10 years ago in 2011, I had a pleasure of moderating David's lecture in Moscow. I think it was called the Future of Physics. But why, why it is interesting, one year later, David, you came to Moscow again and gave another lecture called The Century of Quantum Mechanics. And why is that interesting? Because that lecture was supported by the Zimin Foundation. Frankly, I didn't remember. I just <laughs> read it uh, preparing to, to this talk today. And this is how interconnected the world is. By that time, uh, our foundation uh, was uh, focused on supporting education, uh, talented people in science, and uh, of course, science popularization. But in 2017, we brainstormed what would be the best next stage for the foundation, how we can achieve the maximum impact in the next stage globally. And we chose uh, maximizing the research translation impact as this focus, as something we can do in partnerships with uh, universities and research centers. Um, we started doing that in 2017, and uh, in 2018, the first partner of the Zibin Foundation became Tel Aviv University. So it was uh, a bit less than three years ago when we uh, established uh, the Institute, which is uh, now working very well, uh, named the Zimin Institute for Engineering Solutions uh, Advancing Better Lives at Tel Aviv University. Um, that was a really interesting time. And by, by that time, that was an experiment. Now, three years later, we see that uh, it is working uh, really well and we are we, we managed to, to work together as partners very well. Um, 15 projects have been supported. I will remind uh, to those of you who know and uh, just uh, say a few words to those of you who don't know. Uh, 15 projects were supported uh, over three years in uh, different areas. Uh, the areas include uh, AI in medicine, uh, advanced sensors, robotics and healthcare, digital health technologies, and th there are many more. These are just the ones that are in my memory. Um, now about half of these projects uh, have already made their first steps, in some cases very advanced steps, 
in the applied area, uh, generating uh, patents that are being licensed or creating the first uh, um, commercial teams. And we really want to achieve the, our vision uh, in the long term, which is uh, helping many more ideas that are being born in laboratories see the world in the applied area. Make sure that these uh, technologies that may be generated by people in the laboratories having the new ideas uh, bring real value to people in the world and do not only stay on paper. Combine uh, theory and practice in the best way. So um, what can we expect uh, next? Um, I'm, I'm very happy to say that now after three years when uh, Zimin Institute's project, uh, which is about what I just said, maximizing this uh, impact of research translation works not only uh, at Tau and even not only in Israel, but also in the United States. Now we see that Tel Aviv University uh, remains our core partner. And uh, I would say even has become stronger as this partner. So uh, it means that in the future, we would be happy to work on expanding this relationship and uh, the impact jointly. Um, you know, in general, I've been a strong believer in that so the best things happen when you concentrate the effort on what has already proven to work. And the best things uh, in life uh, come from uh, concentration and compounding. So, um, the area of the Zimian Institute at Tel Aviv University uh, can be slightly extended to cover more in uh, artificial intelligence and in medicine and uh, many related areas, which uh, we will be uh, very happy to, to help with uh, and support. And then the impact can be uh, even stronger. Quantum computers, when ready, will definitely uh, bring a lot of changes in uh, technologies in uh, more or less all applied areas, but of course, to, to medicine uh, uh, and uh, engineering where we work. Uh, although, um, David, you mentioned, you believe they might be uh, available in uh, 10 to 30 years. You know, I recall a talk with uh, um, Professor Wolfgang Ketterle from uh, MIT Harvard Center for Ultra Cold Atoms in uh, 2010 who was uh, on the board of a Russian quantum center that I was running at that time. Uh, and uh, he was ready to bet his money on uh, quantum computers appearing uh, within 30 years from that time. And that was 10 years ago. So uh, he might be a bit more optimistic. And if uh, we expect to see commercial quantum computers in, within 20 years from now, the next five, seven years, and maybe even now is the right time to uh, work on and invest uh, effort uh, into the uh, uh, applications. Uh, with that, uh, I would like to, to wish uh, good luck to Tel Aviv University uh, in these efforts and uh, to our partnership. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, actually, thank, uh, I thank all of you, David, uh, Michal, uh, Hayit, Mark again. And uh, hopefully next time we are going to do it in our real auditorium together. We'll also offer some uh, sweets before that. Uh, so as, they used, as we used to say in Hebrew, uh, next year in, you know, next year in Jerusalem, let's say next year in Tel Aviv. Thank you all.